Welcome. All right. Thanks for inviting us out here, Michael. We're at Wang Walk today. This is this is Michael. He's been out here since 20... 2014. Yep, 2014. Um, it's uh, 170 acres of um, previously, you know, sort of marginal cattle country with some dairy country. We've got dairy old dairy farms nearby, but. Um, We've taken the cattle off it and just treated it like a sort of a regeneration project with a bit of, um, and, the, and, and the project that I'm particularly keen to get some feedback on is the, an orchard that we've tried to set up, sort of along permaculture principles. Yep. So um, when you look down there, you can, you can see the north facing aspect of this thing. Uh, we um, f thought we'd better put a, um, some of a wildlife fence around it so we didn't get wallabies and uh, bandicoots and rabbits and stuff um, chomping down the trees and that seems to have been fairly successful although if you leave the gates open they're in like Flynn they they will you know you'll have kangaroos through there you know within 24 hours yeah. so um, it must be giving off something attractive <laughs> to uh, the wildlife around here but um yeah so there's we looked through with some permaculture books and came up with the idea of swales which are um, ditches and mounds dug along contour lines um, so that they intercept the water flow down a hill and the, in the distance between them is sort of a function of steepness and rainfall so I think we get about 800 mil here or so I'm not quite sure General but, um, but of course that is you know highly variable so um, the um, we've, we've settled on it. We settle on about six meters or so between swales, um, and the idea was eventually for the we put some guard wattles in and some leguminous like uh, um, perennials like uh, uh, pigeon pea, crotalaria. That's it. And the wattles get continuously chomped back or trimmed back and act as a bit of a mulch while their roots break up the soil and they, they, the theory is that it all gets added in as nitrogen and, and organic matter. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we've, it's 50 by 50 metres, that gives us a good area to fence perimeter ratio so it's a bit more cost effective. The water tank just above here we put in so that it takes excess water off the sheds and house and we're lucky enough to have it just drain down uh, without pumps. Um, in the drought we've had to refill the tank several times from from the house tanks and yeah. um, yep but you know it was and it, the project starting off did coincide with the start of the three years of really low rainfall so right. yeah and this dam below us when was that the built? dam was put in in 2016 but we haven't needed any water from that it's um uh but it, we, it's good to know it's there and it, it's actually our neighbors ended up using water from the dam um up till the rain started yeah he's got a nursery and so on so but it's just a great thing to have in the landscape i think mollison said uh, any dam was like a jewel in the landscape it's got so, so many functions so we've got ducks there, cormorant, turtle, there's eels. Um, we put some silver perch in there, but I, that was about three years ago. But I don't know if they're still there. I doubt, I doubt it somehow. It's been popular with the cormorants. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Now you brought a couple of um, bottles down here to yeah. demonstrate an issue that you're dealing with out here at Wilena. Or... Yes. Yeah. So, well, okay, the um, soil here is mainly clay there's not much topsoil at all um, and you go down pretty quickly you get this clay and this the clay here is called a dispersible or reactive clay so that means it swells and shrinks with water content it doesn't readily give up water to plants uh, it makes it tricky to build on because of the structural implications um, and it is amenable to remediation with gypsum and also with a lot, putting a lot of organic matter in. So basically the microorganisms, the fungi and so on, get in there, break it up, let water get through and make it much, much better sort of set up for, for whatever you're planting. So the test, well, I was just replicating here, about an hour ago, um, I uh, just put a bit of clay in um, some water and this is, this is the clay uh, without any treatment. So. It, you can see how it's reacted. It's it's in suspension in the water. 
it's not, you know, it's really highly unstable. Uh, you add a bit of gypsum and all of a sudden the clay quietens down, forms a nice sediment layer in the bottom. And presumably, I mean, that, that I understood was a sort of a diagnostic uh, for, for dispersible clays and the way, way they behave. So when building those swales, where, yeah. how did you manage this and what sort of, what sort of fields are you using? Well, it, well, we can come down and have yeah, a look let's, actually. Let's wander down. It, it, it didn't make a lot of difference doing the swales. The swales were just cut by a 15 tonne excavator um, using laser levelling. So, and it only took them, you know, a couple of hours to do, do the whole job. So, really efficient. I'd, mm. I'd hate to think what it would do, you know, how long it would take doing it by hand. Mm. On the way in, you'll, <laughs> yeah, so really highly efficient. Yeah. And we're lucky enough to have a really good set of um, uh, earth, moving, earth moving guys, the father and son team here, just magnificent. On the way in, you'll see the patent pending Greek rain gauge, <laughs> which is uh, gel, no. Jalna water, so this is over the last, <laughs> you can see how much water rain we've had in the last little while, I'll show you. This is just a, the last couple of weeks, so I've kept it there for you to see. So when you, when you um, walk through the block, this, this orchard area, you'll feel how much water there is there. So yeah, totally the opposite, obviously, you know, six, six months ago, seven months ago. Okay, so um, so just be careful, Joe, because it's really slidey. So I yep. use one of these. So these are the original swales here. There's, there's five main swales, um, and we, I'm not sure how you like to play it, but um, you'll see between them. I've realised that to get a food forest happening here and get a continuous cover of fruit bear, fruit trees would have taken like a hundred years or something you know it's just not going to happen so that was a f one of the you know learning you know steps was to get some more swales dug in between the existing swales so that speeds the process up so the original swales were just like i said dug by the digger along a um a, a contour line and that does a couple of things it, it gives you double your soil thickness straight away because you're folding back the soil from the from the ditch from the swale back on itself and yes it's intercepting a um, overland water runoff so these swales are about four years old now just along here and i've been pretty slack with the maintenance but it it doesn't really matter that much i think i'm just concentrating on keeping a little clear area around each tree putting some mulch around, maybe some newspaper to, for weed suppression, no chemicals, apart from a bit of uh, chick manure, chicken yeah. manure. So look, we can... We, green wattles are featured heavily. Yes, they're the, okay, yeah, they're the guard wattles. There's, an, there's heaps of these, they're, they were planted regularly, obviously. We weren't quite sure what the best distance was, but the main thing is to, and they did magnificent, they do magnificent work when it's windy, they'll shelter these little trees, yep. but you don't want to get in too vigorous because they're going to overshade them, so you, you need your light. So that just come back. Pea looks like it might be nearing the end of it, so. Yeah. Well, the pigeon peas, yeah. Right. So you can, yeah. This, okay, well, learning all the time, there's some, there's this yellowy patches developing on the, on the leaves, and I think that's called chlorosis, mm. which means there's some deficiencies there. Usually nitrogen when it's, when it's yellow is, is deficient. Okay, yeah. all right. You might find if you cut that pigeon pea to the ground, it might release a bit of nitrogen in the soil. Okay, a excellent. Bit of piss wouldn't go astray, well, well, I would suggest. All right, well, I won't do that now if you don't. <laughs> but um, yeah, so coming back and suppressing the weeds, um, and of course, mulch is just amazing, encourages microorganisms stops evaporation and stops you know suppresses weeds for the tree I imagine there'd be good biological activity under yeah that, there under is yeah stuff. yeah so th the main thing is to not get the bark mulch up around the graft site there that's getting getting a bit close on that one and after seeing this sort of this sort of pattern I, i've put a bit more chicken manure around there's so many factors involved aren't there i mean in um how well your plants are going to do so like this is a monsteria, I think, or something. I thought this is going to do really well, because oh, yeah. because we've got them growing in the bush, yeah. and they they grow, you know, like ten feet high. But 
for some reason, that's the mysterio after four years. It's done bugger all. So something's gone wrong. Yeah. Maybe it was the genetics of the particular individual. Maybe the way I dug the hole in it just is clay and just sitting there not doing anything. And competition too is probably a factor. It's got a fair bit to work against, yeah. Well, um, we can keep going through if you like, but um, yeah. we'll just show you a couple of rows, Joel, and see what yeah, you think if, you, if it doesn't get too boring. So through, yeah, so there's the pigeon peas again. So they're, no, they're more or less going to be, they're self-seeding now. The original pigeon peas were about three three years ago and they just keep coming back. They're, they're awesome. Have you been harvesting the, the dry uh, pods? Yeah, there? yeah. So I think for the swale, like this new swale behind you, Joel, I'm going to just put pigeon peas and cow peas all through. Oh, yeah. They're much easier to deal with than the, um, than, than the wattles. And hopefully there'll be a wind bar there'll be a wind shield effect from these rows anyway. I see you've put some oaks along. Exactly, the yeah. There's some casuarinas, yes. So because of the hot, dry, westerly winds and, and also the cold westerlies as well. So um, just moving along, the you know the the guavas, the cherry guavas are supposed to be these are from a local orchard yeah. and they were doing really well on the orchardist block and yeah. so and they're said to do well in clay soil, slightly acidic, you know, pH 5.56. So, and they, they are, they're, this is the second crop. Um, this is a whole not, lot of new trees going to go in, so that's what all the guards are doing there. Here's a, this is going to be a coffee. We'll be um, roasting our own coffee in about 20 years, I reckon. This is a coffee tree. But um, there's a lot of competition and stuff coming through, but keeping the mulch away from the, 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 the trunk. Some cow peas coming through, you know, goodness knows what else is, is in there. I know I've got a blue tongue lizard in here and somewhere further along you'll see where a bandicoot's been digging in. They're supposed to be a, an asset, I think. Do you think? I mean, they, they help. They get to the roots yeah, of the wattles. They move the mulch around. They move yeah. the mulch around. Depends what's happening and... Yeah, uh, and how many there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want them. <laughs> If Mr. and Mrs. That. Yeah, that's right. If Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Bandicoot move in and have families, that could be a problem. Um, so this is you'll, the citrus is a lot of it has got this chlorosis stuff, but I've just thrown I'm just thrown a bit of spring onion in, so it's obviously happy. <laughs> and, and the every avocados, I can't. I'm really impressed with them. Don't throw your seeds away. Stick them in the mulch in a sheltered spot, and in seven years or so, they'll be bearing fruit. So. That's, that, that would have been put in like six months ago or something. Little baby avocado. So this is where it gets pretty muddy. Uh, just just go through pretty quickly, eh? Because there's, there's quite a few. There's about 70 plants here. Another coffee. Uh, avocado through there. Uh, with an extinct grape. More citrus. I'm not too worried about the, the actual swale filling in like this. Some mandarins are starting to appear on that little tree. Another cherry guava. Now, you can see where we, we went astray with the, 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 the spacing between the rows. It was just too wide. So I'm hoping this new swale will do the trick. So I'm getting a local um, land regen team, that's Chris Scott and his mates, and they're going to come through and plant another hundred or so trees from up, yeah. Sweet. Yeah, just take care, Joel. It's, uh, so the macadamia was a disappointment. Same thing as with the monsteria, probably a problem with the roots getting bound up in the clay soil, I think we didn't do any preparation other than the swale. In these new swales the digger used as before actually folding this the swale back and digging this the actual swale ditch went in and ripped with a ripper so he's gone through with a single thing about that big on on the digger attachment and just ripped the clay so he's broken up the clay and we've sprinkled gypsum over about you know like what do we put I think it was like a handful every square meter. That's 
something like at a rate of two two and a half tons a, a hectare something like that so we've stuck a, a ton of gypsum on, on all up on six swale lines and also a little bit of fertilizer so we're just hoping that'll really help this new lot of plants and learning from our mistakes so, so some of the this is a grapefruit and that's awesome that's uh it seems to be the citrus are, i'm impressed by how tough they are in general so to me that looks pretty good these are sunflower seeds so just throwing new seeds seeds in just for fun and see what comes up yep. but i guess More bees growing. yeah and bees are going to be attracted to them hopefully these are the fireweed is a you know very prominent you know weed species around here but at least it attracts bees see if i can uh, yeah so you know these it's just amazing how these plants just volunteer and come up but these are sort of like a sort of a I don't know what docks they come the through almost like yeah but they're like a native yeah right yeah, docks. Yeah, like docks so they're pretty good for soil apparently and good taproot yep not yep. too bad in a salad okay <laughs> <laughs> so multi-purpose <laughs> yeah yep um mandarins um not to get back and trim the wattles back this is a what's this a dragon fruit that's supposed to be a, it's a very spreading it's ice cream bean ice cream bean ice cream bean that's it ice cream bean so apparently a good pioneer species Joel yeah they they uh, are leguminous and yep. can you know get the rhizobium on their roots and really grow quite vigorously yep um, one of those plants that are marginally weedy yep the sort of thing where untidy um, oh in terms of spreading into bushland okay yeah so it's a good one to, to net if possible uh, okay all Cheryl right guava is another one in that category uh-huh okay it's not a bad tree to have as a weed it beats some of the others <laughs> they're gorgeous trees yeah I, I had a few of them out the front of my place until they got too big and sniffed out the sewer line oh uh, okay all right <laughs> i see what you mean so yeah um all right now well that's good to know behind it there's an avocado that loves where it is that's again from a seed the avocados we put in from trees didn't do so well they just sort of folded up after the first hot days and that was it they're pretty sensitive to drying out so i'm hoping this guy you know just keeps going yeah. you know no trouble at all to plant you just put the avocado seed in about the same depth as the seed and yeah. that's it uh, i think that's a hawaiian uh, hawaiian guava or a fajoa i think it's like a fajoa or yep some people call them something other guavas as well fajoa but again yeah yep <laughs> Favourite of fruit guys, didn't you? Oh. <laughs> That's a jackfruit that yeah. seems to be doing something now. That would be a pretty trendy. That would be a huge tree one day. That would be great. At the moment, the, um, the sunflower is sort of dominant, but yeah, it would be good to see that. Um, apparently a beautiful tree, mm. and the fruit is just got lots of different you know, ways to cook it. But not a lot, you don't have to care too heavily for them do you just oh, I've never grown them but yeah yeah here, I think they can be highly highly productive we'll soon find out <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, another uh, Hawaiian guava feijoa cherry guava I think and the more the um, the soil gets going the happier these sort of trees like the avocado look you know they really are you know it's just that thing about this what's going on under this the ground and really being so important and um, so we might come across the miss the bandicoots digging soon but yeah again the, these um uh guavas yeah awesome which one this one here it's like a custard apple similar. which one do you reckon john this one's straight in front of me. Really? I don't know. Oh. Another kind of guava. There's several types, aren't there? Mm. Anyway, it, it does seem to be enjoying it there. That's it's that crotillaria you, you mentioned, and then there's the uh, sunflowers. 
but I love that rich mix, you know. Yep. Yeah, you wouldn't get, I don't think you'd get this in a commercial orchard, and, <laughs> and I'd go broke anyway if <laughs> I tried to grow it for money. The um, blueberries, uh, I'm hoping we'll get some, we, we did get a little tiny crop, um, I think they're just folding up for winter now. Um, these, uh, I really, I really like the mulberries as a tree and, and something you can climb up in and it's good for, great for kids and, and they seem to be pretty tough and, and do well in these conditions too. They're pretty forgiving and I'm hoping they'll be one of the major components of the canopy if, if it ever develops. So the next lot of planting will have a lot of mulberries in it, both the black mulberry and the um, white mulberry. More, more crotillaria. Should we keep going, Joel? You... Just, um, give a, um, you can see the water how it's intercepted. That's an overview of the rest of it from here. Yeah, you can right. basically more of the same. There's uh, down below in the lower two swales, I sort of predicted it would be a bit drier. So there's more olives there and dry and figs. But Again, the, I don't think the clay soil is the best for them and they didn't get the gypsum treatment. Most of the star performers you can see are the mulberries and citrus. I'm not sure, um, when, when you see this, see the mound that they've dug up, it just shows how much rock is in this, in this countryside. So, so uh, <laughs> I thought that would happen. The screen and not my yeah. <laughs> so a couple of things you can see the water intercepted by the the swale. See just behind mm. there, and um, heaps of rock. So I've just had to come back in with a tractor and a wheelbarrow, and it's going to take days to get all that out. But I'm not sure what you think of putting rock around the plants. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking um, they can use rock as a mulch, and they and they do use it in dry climates. And around the um, overflows of your swale, you know, if you've got a planned overflow, some rock around that that uh, overflow is fantastic to okay. keep it stable. We used a lot of the rock um, on, on the spillway of the dam because the, the dams being constructed here, the older dams, uh, have a lot of um, spillway erosion because they were built without realising that the dispersible clays mm. were just erode. They caught this tunnel erosion and all sorts of stuff. So we've redirected this runoff of the older dams and stuck a lot of rock in there on top of geocloth uh, just to stop the headwall erosion that was developing. Yeah. And pretty much the same. That's where the that's where the olives are. And and I've heard from people growing olives that don't bother if unless you've got an olive orchard and you, you you're right into olives. They're they are although they're a beautiful fruit when and you know when you know what you're doing. It's just so much effort to get that olive oil or, or pickled olives. You I don't really know what you think. Bulk for olive oil. Yeah. But, you know, we, we got a just a single olive tree and we pickle them. <laughs> you do? <laughs> if we beat the birds to it. Yeah, oh, wow. Well. You know, fermented in salt. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll get your recipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that I think is going to be a while down the track. Um, how are your soils at, at Foster? We're clay where we are. Do we? yeah. We're on a, a little hill in Foster that, that's called Tob Wobber, which means the place <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know if the, if the orchard doesn't succeed we'll go into clay we can go into pottery and you know have a kiln <laughs> but um well, lovely thanks for the tour this morning that's absolutely a pleasure yeah we'd be uh, keen to revisit as as everything progresses and see how it's cracking it'll be good to see how these new plantings go when they go in yeah thanks thanks so much john it'd be great to get feedback from anyone out there who's watched this as well Sweet, mate. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll share it once I'm, once I'm in some reception. <laughs> okay, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Pleasure.